Hi, welcome to the second half of session two of History 3380, World Civilizations. Now, in the first part of session two, as it's marked on the syllabus, I was talking about both religions and ideologies in the pre-modern world, from ancient times up to the early modern period. And we were looking at particular aspects of commonality between ideologies and religions, whether we're talking Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, or talking ideologies like Confucianism, the Greek philosophers, that with all of these religions and ideologies, they reflected an attempt by human beings, first of all, to try to understand the meaning of human life, you know, what is the purpose of human existence, to ask other large questions like, why is there death, well, the meaning of death? Secondly, to also try to understand the physical world, the physical phenomena, something that we consider simple today like the weather or the movement of heavenly bodies. But in addition to that, there were also efforts to explore religion and ideological principles in an effort to bring order to the world around us. And that could both be in the sense of trying to understand the universe, the physical universe, as an orderly entity, even though it doesn't seem to be oftentimes. And secondly, to try to bring order to human societies. And this became particularly important as human societies moved from basic horticulture, the raising of crops by hand, if you will, to agriculture, the use of uh, plow animals, and the development of what we consider civilizations. As human societies became more complex, there also was a compelling need for people to try to organize their societies and keep them orderly. Now, with both religion and with ideologies, uh, they came to serve two purposes in this regard. In many cases, religions, and we could count Buddhism, for example, and Christianity, uh, in some cases, religions questioned the existing system. Buddhism was a challenge to Hinduism. Christianity was, in effect, a challenge to Judaism. So in many instances, religions, and ideologies as well, uh, could come to question the existing order, the existing social or cultural system, and challenge it. On the other hand, these ideologies and religions might also wind up helping to solidify the existing order, providing it with legitimacy. And we see that, for example, with Buddhism, that Buddhism challenges Hinduism in the Indian subcontinent, but then later becomes, at least for a time, the favored religion of the uh, Chinese emperors. And for a time, it serves to bolster their position and help create stability in society. We started looking at Christianity in the last part of the first, of session two. And in the second part of session two today, I want to continue looking at Christianity, not simply in its role as challenging Judaism, which we talked about last time, but also in the sense of how it became the official religion, if you want, of the Roman Empire. We've just gotten to start talking about that. How did that happen? And as we will see, Christianity influences the Roman Empire, of course, but also the Roman Empire comes to significantly influence the Christian religion and how it is structured, the hierarchy that it takes on. And then we're going to look at Islam and see how Islam eventually evolved into a religion as well that helped provide legitimacy for a series of imperial systems uh, in what we most commonly call the Middle East. Okay, let's turn to the first slide and start talking about this. Um, in this first slide, hello, first slide? We need a first slide. Is it up? Okay, I'm not seeing it back here, that's why. Okay, first slide. <laughs> We're talking about the imperial religions of Christianity. In other words, Christianity came to be closely identified with the Roman Empire. And this happened specifically under two emperors, Constantine and Theodosius, in the fourth century. Constantine was the first. Uh, Constantine uh, came to favor Christianity and eventually 
uh, accepted Christianity himself, but only at the end of his life. Or as Theodosius, we have a more long-term exercise of interaction between Christianity and the Roman Empire itself. Now, the reason for this, uh, practically speaking, was that the empire itself was in serious trouble in decline, being significantly challenged in various regions, and emperors were looking for ways of maintaining order within the empire at a time when the simple exercise of military force would not be sufficient to maintain stability. Christianity, which originally had been a, seen as a threat to the empire because it required its converts uh, to reject their previous religious beliefs, uh, religious beliefs that were common throughout the Roman Empire, uh, that necessity had made Christianity a threat to the empire, and Christians had, of course, been persecuted within the Roman Empire. But now, with the empire itself in need of stability, Christianity could help bring order by ensuring that its converts, its members, recognized the authority of the Roman emperor. And of course, this is critical to any political system. If it's going to survive over time, the people within it have to be accepting of the legitimacy of the political order. Simply the exercise of brute force, yes, it can ensure stability over the short term. But if in the long term, the vast majority of the population doesn't accept Christian, uh, doesn't accept Christian, doesn't accept the legitimacy of the existing political system, it can't survive. And that was a key reason why the Roman emperors embraced Christianity. Now, as this is happening, the church itself is starting to, shall we say, stabilize. And what that meant in particular was enforcing orthodoxy. Most religions early on provide an environment in which there is a freewheeling exchange of ideas and beliefs. Early Christianity was like this. People had many ver very different versions of what the life of Christ meant, what the meaning of Christianity was. But over time, the emerging Christian church came to impose a fixed set of ideas that were to be taken as the official established religion. And this happens through a series of church conferences that take place uh, in the fourth, fifth, sixth century and beyond. And these conferences were designed to bring together key members of the Christian community and to lay out in specific terms what were the beliefs of Christians, what were the official authorized orthodox beliefs. And at times, such as during the Nicene Conference, they'd come up with a creed. If you're a Christian, you know uh, these creeds say that I believe in this, I believe in that, you know, believe that Jesus is one of the Son of God, etc. They lay out in specific terms what the accepted beliefs are. Here we're getting into the creation of a, a religious bureaucracy. There is now an official form of the religion, official set of beliefs, and with it is coming an official set of bureaucrats who will manage the Christian church. Now, as this is happening, of course, it is not all simply the creation of this elaborate organization. There is also the fact that with all religions of any size, there is adaptation depending upon where the religion happens to spread. In the case of Christianity, Europe, Western Asia, the northeastern parts of Africa or the eastern Mediterranean. Remember, as Christianity or other religions like Islam spread over vast areas, they encounter people of different ethnic backgrounds, different cultures, different languages, and different religious practices from the past. And as a result, Christianity in North Africa doesn't look exactly like what Christianity in Rome does. It doesn't look the same as Christianity in the Eastern Mediterranean because people put emphasis on different parts of Christianity, those portions that seem to best fit their beliefs and needs. So we do have this official orthodoxy, but still, even then, below the surface, there are always ideas adaptations of the religion that occur in different regions of the world. And this is true of every major religion, any religion that in fact encompasses 
distinct ethnic and linguistic groups is going to come up with different traditions even within the orthodox structure of the church, such as the Christian church. Now, in the next slide, we're looking at what happens to the Roman Empire as it embraces Christianity. And one of the things that happens is that the Roman Empire is gradually breaking apart into two separate entities, an Eastern and a Western Empire. One in the Eastern Mediterranean, in Constantinople, what is now part of modern day Turkey, and then of course in Rome and Italy, the Western Church. Uh, or Western Empire, I'm sorry, but the two overlap so thoroughly here that it's easy to mix one with the other. So we have an emerging distinction between an Eastern imperial system and a Western imperial system. One sign essentially of decline, uh, the fact that the Eastern Empire over time remains more powerful and more stable than does the Western Empire centered in Rome where the Roman Empire first began, a sign that the old empire is starting to weaken. But as that is happening, the church increasingly is taking on the structures of the empire, and we'll see this in more detail in a couple of minutes. What that means is that the church, as it organizes itself as a bureaucracy, starts to imitate the empire itself. Uh, a very basic example for now. Over time, we come to have two major branches of Christianity in the pre-modern world. One, Orthodox Christianity, if you want to call it that, Eastern Orthodoxy, a form, a branch of Christianity identified with the Eastern Empire, with Constantinople. And then a Western branch, known as variously as the Roman Catholic Church, you know, it's the Roman part in there, uh, the Church of Rome, etc., which is centered in the city of Rome and which comes to control, essentially, the Christian church and faith in Western Europe. So even the church itself and the way it's structured with these two separate branches reflects the imperial system which itself is fractured between East and West. Now as far as the West goes, as I said, the splitting was a sign that in fact the empire itself was weakening, especially its older branch, the Western half of the empire, the part centered in Rome. That becomes clear as Germanic tribes had long been dominated by the Romans, as Germanic tribes begin to invade uh, the territories of the Roman Empire and successfully uh, carry out military actions against the Roman military. In fact, over time, uh, these German invaders, if you will, the German tribal groups, will essentially come to take over the Roman military. If you look at the Roman army, uh, as we get into the later centuries, the fifth, sixth centuries, you're looking at an army that is composed largely of groups like the Germanic tribes rather than residents of uh, the Italian peninsula, which had been, of course, at the core of the original empire and its army. As this is happening and as the power of the Roman emperor decreases, the power of the pope, the ruler of the Christian church in the West increases. We get a phenomenon that's known as papal Caesarism. What that means is that Caesar, of course, was the emperor. From the time of the founding of the empire by Julius Caesar, Caesar had been the term applied to the Roman emperor. And what papal Caesarism means is that the head of the Roman Catholic Church, the church in the West, is taking on many of the functions of a Roman emperor, meaning he is reaching beyond just the spiritual sphere where Christianity had originated, people's concerns about uh, their afterlife and about their ethical behavior in this life, moving beyond that to consider the practical, political, and military implications of what's going on in the West. Now, the power of succeeding popes by the 10th century is closely linked to another evolving phenomenon, and that is the emergence of a series of warrior states to replace the old empire. I mean, the empire has disintegrated by the 8th century, okay? If you're talking about the 700s of the contemporary era, that's effectively the end of the Roman Empire. There really is no more Roman Empire. So what's going to replace it? 
after the 8th century. Well, gradually the emergence in the old empire of a series of warrior states. And one of them is the Frankish state in what we now call France. The Frankish state was fairly typical of these warrior states that emerged after the decline of the Roman Empire. They combined essentially two basic elements. One, an emphasis on warlike traditions of expanding their power and their influence through warfare, usually against each other. And secondly, their acceptance of Christianity. Typically, if you look at the various states that you know, come to constitute post-Roman Europe, they're typified by the Frankish state in combining these two aspects. Now, among the states that now constitute Europe, post-Roman Europe, are the papal states. The Pope himself controls a series of provinces that cut a swath across the Italian peninsula. Uh, claims that go back supposedly to the time of the Emperor Constantine that essentially asserted that Constantine had granted the Pope the right to govern these provinces so that the Pope was literally not only a religious leader but also a political leader, a leader of his own state, if you will, the Papal States. It's kind of been <laughs> narrowed down these days to the Vatican. Uh, but it used to con constitute a series of provinces that ran across Italy. So the Pope actually becomes part of this process in which the old Roman Empire is breaking up into a series of warrior states. And the Papal States were no less a part of this tradition, not only in being Christian, of course, uh, being headed by the Pope, but a variety of popes were also well-known warriors. I mean, they conducted warfare, they attacked other states, just like anybody else. You know, not quite the way you envision popes in the modern era. Um, but in this age, after the collapse of the Roman Empire, popes carried out exactly that kind of function. So here we have a religious institution, the Catholic Church, which has now taken on both religious responsibilities, but also is increasingly adopting political activities as part of its responsibilities in post-Roman Europe. Now, if we look at the next slide, we'll see that there is a merging of interests between the Roman Pope and the Frankish state. And this comes with this event with the coronation of Charles the Great, Charlemagne, the 10th century emperor of, oh, well, the ruler, I should say, of the Frankish state, who is crowned as Holy Roman Emperor by Pope Leo III. What does this mean? Basically, the Pope has said that the Frankish state, and this was a practical move, what was the strongest warrior state among these post-Roman European states? The Frankish state. So the Pope says, well, look at it. Charles the Great, Charlemagne, who was the ruler of the Frankish state, I'm now telling him that he is the heir to the old Roman Empire. But this is now a holy Roman Empire, of course, because it is enjoying the blessing of the Christian church. What does all of this mean? Well, in practical terms, uh, it didn't give Charlemagne a lot more power outside of his own provinces and outside of the dynastic system that he controlled. Uh, technically, it was supposed to encompass basically all of modern France and much of what would be modern Germany or the German states. Uh, most of essentially Central Europe and Western Europe supposedly was part of this Holy Roman Empire. In practical terms, most of the other principalities and states went on doing pretty much their own thing. But technically, he was now the heir to the traditions of the Roman Empire. More importantly for us, what the Pope was doing was establishing the fact that now any European prince, king, queen, whatever, who wanted to claim legitimacy to rule over a region had to have the blessing of the Pope in Rome. This was a claim of enormous authority that no, em no emperor, no king, no queen, no prince could rule legitimately without the blessing of the Roman emperor. In practical terms, what that could come down to is if the pope and 
a prince, king, queen came into conflict, that the pope could essentially expel them from the Catholic Church. And if that should happen, that would mean the end of legitimate rule for that particular prince, king, whatever. So here we have the Christian church in the sort of political vacuum created after the collapse of the Roman Empire, taking on enormous authority, claiming to be the source of legitimacy for the rulers of post-Roman Europe. This was not a unique function for religion in the pre-modern world. We've already seen with China and the mandate of heaven that Chinese emperors hmm, were believed to have the right to rule because they enjoyed the mandate of heaven. Well, here we're getting even more explicit a specific religious authority, far more powerful than any religious authority in, let us say, Asia. Uh, a religious authority is claiming the personal right to bestow legitimacy on political rulers. So in the future, the question of sovereignty in the West was entirely tied up with the issue of religious legitimacy, with the blessing of the Christian church. This is why when we get to later centuries, uh, there was such violent conflict in Europe when the Christian church itself split. Because if the church was the source of legitimacy, what did it mean when the church itself split between what were called Catholics and Protestants? You know, what did that mean for legitimacy of individual rulers? Yeah, who had the right to grant legitimacy now if the church itself is split? Here now we really have an imperial papacy because what the Pope is really saying is, look, all of Europe depends upon my granting of legitimacy in order to be able to rule. The height of papal power comes with this particular pope, Innocent III, uh, at the latter stages of the 12th and beginning of the 13th centuries. Uh, Innocent III was a, a very practical, politically oriented individual who ruled the papal states and influenced the events in Europe on a day-to-day -day basis, much like any contemporary politician, any contemporary head of state would do in the modern world. In other words, he would confront uh, individual sovereigns, challenge their authority. Uh, he would engage in warfare, if necessary, with individual states in order to get his way. He was very as much a player in the power politics of pre-modern Europe as any sovereign in the region. So we have a church that has become totally interconnected with the political systems of Europe. This is a far cry from what had happened 1,300 years earlier when, of course, Christ had appeared as a challenger to the establishment, the establishment of Judaism. Now here was the church founded on his teachings that had become really the establishment institution of Europe. If we go to the next slide, we'll see that this authority stemmed not only from the teachings of the church, from the acceptance of the vast majority of the population, of the authority of the pope. It also stemmed from real power, the control of land. That meant lands that were granted to the church. For example, in virtually every state in Europe, sovereigns would award lands to the church for the building of monasteries, the building of churches, uh, the building of nunneries, and these would include agricultural properties that would be used to support those institutions. So the church is a powerful landowner, and the land that it owns extends beyond the papal states throughout Europe. So you're dealing with real power here, not just you know, ideological power in the sense that people accept the pope's role in the world at this time, but real power based in the ownership of vast amounts of land. And along the way, the church also claimed the right to tithing, uh, essentially a tax upon the faithful throughout Europe, that people had to pay a certain portion of their income, their resources, to help support the church. So the church is extremely powerful, 
has land, has a military, has essentially a tax revenue that it draws not only from lands in Italy but from throughout Europe. This is an extremely powerful institution. And in the process, what has happened by the 13th century is that the church has emerged, and this was going on for a long time before this, has emerged as the contemporary reflection of the Roman administrative system. If you look at the organization of the Christian church, starting from the local level, the local church, the diocese, all the way up to the advisory council to the Pope, the Curia, the top administrative bureau, if you will, or committee in the church, whose power is only exceeded by the Pope. These institutions, from local parish authority with the local priest all the way up to the Curia, and the way they ran the system of the church, were all replicas of the Roman bureaucracy. In other words, they took the Roman bureaucracy and directly imitated it as the administrative structure of the church. You look at the Roman Catholic Church even today. You know, the Pope wears you know, what's a basically a crown because he is seen as this imperial authority, even now. His claims may be only spiritual, but still seen as an imperial authority. And you look at the administrative structures all the way down the line, from cardinals to bishops to parish priests, all of that is a reflection of exactly how the Romans, in the same kind of top-down bureaucratic system, administered their empire. It was modeled on precisely that system. So the church not only imitates the power of the Roman Empire, it also mimics the bureaucratic system by which Rome had ruled that vast empire. Also, in terms of church law, the laws that govern how the church functions, how people within the church, the faithful, are to be treated, let us say in terms of issues like uh, challenging church orthodoxy, challenging the principles of Christianity. How was someone to be dealt with? Well, there were systems under which these people could be put on trial. If they're accused of heresy, apostasy, various threats to the orthodox beliefs of the church, that legal system of canon law was based directly on Roman law. So again, the Catholic Church has become the mimic of the Roman Empire. And so to church courts and how they functioned, how judges were selected, etc., and how evidence could be presented, all of that was based directly on the old Roman system. So we see this transition over time where the Christian church was once a challenger of the authority of the Roman Empire, a threat to stability. By the fourth century of the contemporary era, it has become a partner with the Roman Empire as the emperors look for a stabilizing force as their power diminishes. And then by the eighth century, when the empire has disappeared, the church has emerged as the most powerful force in Western Europe and comes to exercise many of the authorities, especially secular authorities, in other words, political power, uh, that the Roman emperor once had. And eventually, by the 13th century, no later than that, the church has thoroughly replicated the administrative structures of the old Roman Empire. So here we have a religion which again starts off as a sort of rebellious force and in time comes to represent the establishment of Western Europe. It is the force that provides legitimacy for political rule throughout the empire, I mean, the, the empire, throughout the post-Roman portions of Europe. Now, over time, challenges will emerge to this kind of system. This is part of what we're going to see in terms of the process of modernization. This is not unique, as I said, to just Europe. The idea that religion, and in this case specific, a specific organized religion, provides legitimacy for political rule. What empowers you to be king, queen, or whatever, emperor? The fact that God has granted you the authority to rule in his name and specifically through his agent, the Pope. That's not uncommon. 
whether it was the rulers of India, China, wherever, Africa, the Americas, and the West Hemisphere, everywhere, some form of religious legitimacy underpinned political sovereignty around the world. So this is an extreme version of it because it was highly organized, highly bureaucratized. But nevertheless, across the world, there is really an instance where anyone rules any significant political entity without some type of grant of religious authority. Over time, as I said, part of the move towards modernization that we'll see is when people begin to question and challenge whether in fact religious legitimacy can provide the underpinning for political sovereignty. In the meantime, we're going to look at a very different track here on the next slide, uh, that of the evolution of Islam. Islam will never quite get, in fact, never will get, to the point that Christianity got, where you have this single centralized authority exercising enormous power over vast regions. But Islam, too, will undergo a certain degree of bureaucratization but not to the extent that Christianity does. First of all, we need to look at the origin point for Islam, and that was on the Arabian Peninsula, most of which today constitutes modern Saudi Arabia. Two things that were typical of the Arabian Peninsula in the centuries before the rise of Islam where one, nomadic tribal groups, and two, commercial crossroads. And what that means is, commercial crossroads, is that the Middle East, as we now term it, was an exchange point for goods coming from all different directions, from China, from Africa, from Europe. Trade routes converged and crossed in the Middle East over and over again. So this was an area of dynamic commercial interchange. It was one of the nexus points for trade around most of the world, excluding the Western Hemisphere, in the pre-modern era. As far as nomadic tribes, they largely secured their living by raising of animals such as horses, and, but also through warfare warring on each other and also attacking uh, trade caravans as a way of securing resources. These were typical groups in the Arabian Peninsula. But again, they stood in contrast to a series of urban centers, like Mecca that we're going to talk about, that were the centers for commercial trade. So we have really almost like two societies operating at the same time, the nomadic tribesmen and the much more sedentary and centrally organized mercantile urban groups that also typified the Arabian Peninsula. Not surprisingly, the Arabian Peninsula was not only a nexus for trade, for the exchange of goods, it was also a nexus for religion. And it's easily explained. Commerce whether we're talking the pre-modern world or the contemporary world, always carries more than just goods. Hmm. Commerce is never just an exchange of material goods hmm. between different peoples and different groups. Always other things are exchanged. One of which, we'll, as we'll see in the next session, is disease. <laughs> One of the reasons we get to an era of epidemic disease is that as trade routes expand and connect more people, people traveling on those trade routes carry disease very quickly from one part of the earth to the other and set off epidemic outbreaks of disease. But beyond that, and more pertinent to our immediate discussion, is the fact that commerce carries ideas. In the modern world, we can see this relatively easily um, suppose you want to sell iPods uh, someplace, I don't know, Mongolia. Well, 
you can't just sell the iPod. You say, here's an iPod. Okay. Well, what do I do with it? My wife got an iPod a couple weeks ago. I said, well, what do you do with it? <laughs> I mean, it's just a thing, right? How does it work? I don't know. So somebody has to convey information to you to say, how does this thing work? I still don't know how it works. But there has to be a carrying forward of technology. And we, we think of technology, you always think, oh, a machine, like an iPod or a computer. But that's not technology. What technology is is knowledge. It's the knowledge that allows you to create that thing. And that thing isn't worth anything to anyone unless you have the knowledge of how to use it. So in trading that good somewhere, selling it, you also have to convey knowledge. And that suggests, furthermore, other knowledges, not just the practical knowledge of this is how it works. So you get records music and you can listen to the music. OK, but how do I actually use this thing? Well, if you've never been exposed to a computer and you know, what is this? You know, what's this window? You know, what do I do with it? So that assumes other knowledge that has to be conveyed. And then basic knowledge like, well, math, and you know, well, how many songs does it take? Well, I get to know a little bit of math to figure that out. Well, what's its capacity? How much room does each song take up? I can tell you how many songs you can probably put on there. Okay, but I don't know that unless I have basic math. So no matter what kind of good you're exchanging, in the modern world, you're exchanging some kind of information with it, some ideas. In the pre-modern world, one of the most important non-material conveyances of commerce was ideas, but specifically religious ideas. Almost inevitably, among the most active participants in religions are merchants. Why? In part because they're almost always literate. They have to be in order to function at least in long distance trade. But also that means that they have some degree of education and in their long journeys, inevitably they have considerable amount of time to be thinking about their existence, about the meaning of the material world around them. I mean, if you're a peasant, you don't get nearly as much time to do that. You get to be up every day and you're working out in the fields and you're getting tired. Merchant, you're going to spend long hours riding on the back of a camel or on a ship. So there's a good, considerable amount of time for merchants to contemplate the world around them. So as merchants crisscrossed the Arabian Peninsula, they carried with them not only silks from China, gold from Africa, they carried their religious beliefs and they exchanged them. When they met in these cities and towns that were the specific nexus points for trade, they would often exchange ideas, talk about their religion. Well, what's your religion? What are your beliefs? Oh, well, we have different beliefs. So this was an incredible, it was a little bit like being at a university in the sense that here was an opportunity to get exposed to a lot of different ideas and perspectives and interchange those ideas. And inevitably in that kind of environment, and this is one of the reasons you have universities, you create new ideas, new perspectives, new views, because you get people thinking, well, gee, I never thought of it that way. I never had this perspective. Well, we always believed in one God. You guys believe in 12. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that makes any sense. I wonder if maybe somewhere in between lies the, you know, the exact nature of God. You get creative thinking. And this is what happened in the Arabian Peninsula in these centuries before the rise of Islam. Religions like Judaism, Zoroastrianism, and we talked about Zoroastrianism's influence on Judaism and Christianity, and of course Christianity itself, along with a whole array of local deities. There were a variety of natural gods uh, that were worshipped in the Arabian Peninsula. But there's this incredible interplay of people with different religious beliefs. So it wouldn't be terribly surprising to learn that a new set of religious ideas are going to emerge, and when they do, that they're going to be rooted to a considerable degree in the religious beliefs and principles of Christianity, Zoroastrianism, Judaism, because that is the intellectual environment in which Islam emerged. Now Mecca, the if you will, home of Islam, its birthplace, was itself a mercantile center. And naturally, it would be one of the places where 
this vibrant intellectual culture flourished where there was constant exchange of ideas. Among the merchants who were influenced by this confluence of religious ideas was Muhammad. He was himself a merchant and also ultimately a visionary in the very real sense of having visions, inspirations that led him to become the prophet of Islam. So we can very much set Muhammad in a historical environmental context, in this rich intellectual environment, these vibrant discussions about religion. And Muhammad himself will, in fact, draw on many of the ideas that he receives from these other religious traditions. Now, as far as the faith which he creates, some of the practical, or I'd say some of the principal aspects of it. One is acceptance, meaning the acceptance of your position as a believer, as a subject of God. The need to live a moral life, to follow a moral code. This is not unique to Islam, of course. Christianity has a moral code, Judaism, Buddhism. And, but also the idea of a godly community, of a community that is both bound together by its Islamic faith, but also an Islamic community that reflects in very real and practical ways its Islamic faith. In other words, that your religious faith will be pervasive within society, that will affect every aspect of society. Not just your own spiritual beliefs, but the legal system, the political system, even the economic system, social relationships, personal relationships, all those areas will be influenced by your religious beliefs. Now, Muhammad began in 610, this is when we trace back the origins of Islam. But by 622, he found an increasingly hostile environment, particularly among the merchant elites of Mecca. Many of the ideas that he was preaching were, of course, at odds with local religious practices. And it was feared that his movement would disrupt the all-important commercial activities within Mecca itself. And so Muhammad left Mecca, went to Medina in 622, where he continued to preach and to expand upon his following. In 630, Muhammad planned a return to Mecca. And originally, it looked as though when he arrived with his followers, including many uh, converts from the nomadic tribal groups, uh, that warfare was going to ensue. And that what would happen is that Muhammad and his followers would invade the city and overwhelm it. But the mercantile elite, deciding that discretion was the better part of valor, asked that Muhammad and his followers defer their entrance into the city. And eventually, the elite provided for a peaceful return of Muhammad to Mecca. This event provided the reestablishment of Islam in its birthplace uh, and the, what would become the continuing center of Islam down through the centuries, and that is the city of Mecca. Now, with relative stability restored in the sense that he, he has now returned, uh, Islam continued to evolve in its beliefs and ideas. One of the central beliefs in Islam that is closely tied to the roots of Zoroastrianism, Judaism, and Christianity is this same focus on the struggle between good and evil. Uh, you don't find that kind of same emphasis, let us say, in Buddhism. In Buddhism, there is more of a concern with, well, how does one find peace? How does one find serenity? But here, in these Eastern Mediterranean religions, there is a tremendous emphasis 
on the conflict between good and evil and on the fact that you have to make a choice between good and evil and that your choice, your decisions, ultimately, between those two opposing principles will determine your fate for all time and that indeed there will be a day of reckoning, a judgment day, just as you read about in Christianity, so too in Islam, there will be a judgment day where God will separate the good from the bad. So there are profound consequences to your behavior. It isn't just a matter of will you find personal peace and serenity in this world. It is a matter of your fate for all eternity being determined by the choices that you make. In addition, in Islam, earlier religious figures, including Abraham and Jesus, were seen as prophets, opening the world up to an understanding of the divinity, of the one God. And that Jesus is not, as he would be conceived of in the Christian church, the son of God, but rather another prophet. And so to Muhammad is the, well in this case, ultimate prophet, opening people's eyes to the preaching, well, preachings, the existence of God and what God desires of humankind. So Muhammad very much saw himself as being part of this very long historical tradition within the Eastern Mediterranean. And Islam came to reflect many of the principles and ideas of those earlier religious beliefs and in fact consciously incorporated many of those ideas and the teachings of those earlier religions into its own principles. Now, similar to Judaism and Christianity is the Quran, the holy book the book of scripture, if you will, the word of God. Here again we see this striking similarity between the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the Quran. But something that distinguishes Islam is Sharia, religious law. The important distinction here is in the pervasiveness of Islamic law. If we look at the Christian church again, the Christian church has laws, well, the Roman Christian church, let's say, uh, canon law. But canon law is specifically focused on issues such as uh, the proper conduct and rule by, let us say, bishops, cardinals, etc. Uh, the challenges that may arise to Christian orthodoxy from people who claim alternative interpretations of the Gospels, etc. So it's very much focused on the institution of the church and the specific beliefs of Christianity. But Sharia covers a far wider swath of human behavior. In fact, it encompasses just about every aspect of human life that you can think of. What are the relationships to be between men and women? Specifically through marriage. What are the rules under which economic activity should be conducted? Can you in fact charge interest on loans? Can you loan money and charge interest? No, you're not supposed to. So commercial activity. How are disputes, let us say, over land to be resolved? So Islamic courts which will arise and Islamic judges aren't just ruling on issues of religious faith, religious practice. In fact, they are focusing on every aspect of human life. In some ways, this was one of the great appeals of Islam and in part helps account for its rapid spread because for many people this was an enormously compelling idea that in converting to Islam you weren't just experiencing your own personal spiritual conversion. It was going to help guide you in every aspect of your life. Whether it was your personal relationships, whether it was your commercial activities, almost every aspect of your life 
here were a set of rules provided by Islam to guide you, something that was very distinctive in pre-modern societies, where, yes, religion was extremely important, helped explain the functioning of the universe, helped provide legitimacy to political rule, but in terms of people's everyday lives, there was little in the way of direct religious guidance. You know, if you take, like, the Ten Commandments, the Sermon on the Mount, you know, that's fine, but that's still a little nonspecific, you know. And love my neighbors. Okay, but what if I do if my neighbor moves his fence into my yard? <laughs> How much do I have to love him then? Uh, not nearly as much. Uh, so you need a practical guideline. What does that really mean? You know, what is just and what is legal? You know, in dealing with that kind of thing. Well, Sharia would provide that kind of principle. Also, and this is not unique to Islam, there are what are called the five pillars of Islam, sort of basic principles. One, of course, uh, to pronounce your faith, to announce that indeed you are a believer, uh, to pray five times a day, uh, to take a pilgrimage uh, to Mecca, if possible, during your lifetime. It isn't always possible, of course, for people to do that. So there are some basic principles that are universally accepted, that everyone must practice if they are indeed truly a Muslim. Now, as I suggested earlier, <coughs> Islam underwent a rapid expansion from the Middle East and the Eastern Mediterranean within a couple of centuries. It rapidly spread east and west, all the way to Andalusia, meaning parts of Spain, going westward, and all the way to the Indus River, in other words, the northern part of the Indian subcontinent in less than 200 years, really 150. Hmm? So you've got this huge expanse, all the way from Spain to what would, well, let's call it modern-day Pakistan. Part of the reason for this, again, was that people found a compelling attraction, not only to the spiritual inspiration of Islam, but to the practical side of Sharia that gave them guidance in their lives. But there was another aspect of this as well. Well, two aspects, one of which I'll mention now. And that was that the nomadic tribal groups had early on been won to the side of Islam. And they, of course, helped provide a rapid military force to help spread Islam and its influence across much of, again, what we call the Middle East. So there's a combination of both these nomadic tribesmen and their expansionary powers and the attraction of a religion that seemed to be really completing for human beings that could address both spiritual issues and practical everyday life issues. Now, one thing that's striking about Islam, when we look at Islam compare it to Christianity in its early centuries, is that relatively early on, even before Christianity's acceptance by the Roman Empire, Christianity had started to develop at least an informal hierarchy. People who were recognized as being priests who, in other words, carried out formal religious rites, who served as the intermediaries between believers and the divine. Christ himself had said, you know, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. So that was taken as an indication that there was to be a hierarchical structure. So even before the church began imitating uh, the administrative structures of the Roman Empire, long before that, there was the emergence of a priestly class from the time of the apostles, and particularly the emergence of Paul as a dominating influence and Peter as sort of a governing authority, we start to get the emergence of official religious professionals, if we'd call them that today. But with Islam, we don't see that same emergence of that type of priestly figure. In other words, with priestly figures, we're talking about 
people who carry out the formal religious rites of their faith and people who are involved in intercession between believers and the divine figure. With Islam, there were people directly involved, of course, in the development of Islam and in carrying out the responsibilities of their faith, but here you were dealing with people who were either one, scholars, in other words, they would study the Quran, they would study scripture, they would, uh, the Holy Scripture, they would study Sharia, and they would write commentaries on it, uh, helping people understand, well, what does this mean? Because even Sharia, uh, even though it's far more specific than, let us say, the Ten Commandments, nevertheless, there are still vast areas that people need to find out, well, how does that apply in my specific case? So you have scholars writing and teaching to help people understand the nuances of their religious faith and the specifics of religious law. But they do not carry out priestly functions. They're not responsible for carrying out religious rites. This is not like a Buddhist monk, you know, a Hindu priest, a Christian priest. And you also have judges because, of course, a crucial part of Islam, unlike other religions, is that it has a thoroughgoing legal system that applies not only to specific religious matters, but to matters throughout society. So you need judges who are going to use Sharia uh, to pass judgment on various cases. This may involve, for example, a commercial transaction, land problems. Uh, it can involve uh, antisocial behavior. If you want to politely call it that. Yeah, you're a thief, you're a murderer. <laughs> Uh, you go around beating people up. Uh, the usual stuff <laughs> happens every day. So you needed people in that function as well. But again, judges are not trying to intercede between believers and the divine. Uh, they're not trying to carry out religious rites on behalf of this religion. So there is much more, let's say, open environment in terms of religious thought and action. Some of this helps explain later on the splits that occur in Islam between Shias and Shiites, uh, Shiites and uh, Sunnis. Uh, because there is no single religious authority. By the time the split occurs in Islam, by comparison, the Christian church had already developed the beginnings of orthodoxy, you know, the establishment of conferences of fathers of the church, the leading religious figures in Christianity, they were already setting down the law as to you know, what is the official set of beliefs of Christianity. The situation was far more fluid in Islam at that time, let's say in the fifth century when uh, the church conferences are taking place. Another reality coming out of this is that there is constant interaction as well between politics and religion in a more dynamic way than we see in Christianity in the West. Because in Christianity in the West, there's quickly a conversion, or a convergence, I should say, a convergence between the Christian church and the Roman Empire, which means the church is rapidly becoming the legitimizing force for sovereigns, for rulers in Europe. But the situation is more fluid in Islamic society because it's not clearly established yet that, look at it, Islam is the force providing legitimacy for a particular set of political rulers. As I just mentioned, this fluidity allows for a split that occurs between what we call Sunnis and Shiites. And of course we know that this is a division that has enormous consequences in the contemporary world uh, as we look at events unfolding in Iraq and of course the rise of Iran as a power in the Middle East, all of which we'll get into much later near the end of the course. But this division dates back to the sixth century, to the early times, uh, the seventh century, the, I should say, seventh century, uh, the early era of Islam. And it basically was a split, although it's far more complex than this, over who was the legitimate leader 
of the Islamic community. Meaning, as it came to signify, did it have to be someone who was, in fact, a religious leader? In fact, perhaps a direct descendant of the Prophet Muhammad? Or could the ruler of the Islamic community be a non-religious figure? Let us say, a military official. Sunnis took the broader interpretation that a non-religious figure could rule. Shiites focused on the idea of religious figures and especially descendants of the prophet himself. So this split occurs early on in the history of Islam and part of it can be understood in the sense that bureaucracy, orthodoxy had not yet emerged in Islam itself. In other words, there was still a great deal of fluidity, discussion, and debate. Now, this set of circumstances would not continue indefinitely in Islamic societies. Gradually, the nomadic armies are going to establish political entities, more than one. There is not, in any given period, a single dominant empire like the Roman Empire, although there are important empires that govern much of Islam, but not one that will govern all the Islamic community over time. These emerging empires, these Islamic empires, these political entities, were ruled over by caliphs, people who were considered to be religious figures and whose principal task was to maintain God's law. In other words, the purpose of these rulers was in fact to ensure that the political entities they ruled were authentic Islamic communities, meaning that they obeyed Sharia, that they followed the principles of the Quran. So here we have people who are filling, fulfilling a political function, ruling over these empires, but at the same time, very clearly have very specific religious responsibilities, the maintenance of Islamic communities, the maintenance of God's law. As a whole, Muslims saw themselves as part of a single community. That a central focus of their identity was, of course, their sets of religious beliefs. This also has important repercussions, as we will see, in the contemporary world, where some political ideologists, philosophers, will argue that even in the 21st century, the ultimate identity for those who are Muslim is the fact that they are Islamic, and that that is more important than nationality, ethnicity, tribal identifications. The most important thing is their identity as a community of believers. And this was an important concept in the early history of Islamic communities because, as we will see, they were often very diverse. You have nomadic groups, you have sedentary groups, you have people who are Arabic, you have people from the Eastern Mediterranean who are from vastly different backgrounds, non-Arab groups. One of the first truly powerful and dominant empires that does emerge in the Islamic world is this one, the Umayyad Caliphate. That's a dynastic name, the Umayyads. And over a course of a hundred years, the Umayyads managed to create an imperial system focused on the city of Damascus and ruling over much of what is the modern Middle East. Indeed, the Umayyads essentially mimicked the Romans in creating their imperial system. What it means in this case, unlike the Christian church mimicking the Roman Empire, in this case what it meant was that yes, they create a powerful city-state, Damascus, extend their rule over vast territories, but that rule is largely decentralized. As much as there is an overall empire, 
the direct control over the rest of the empire is mostly focused on the collection of tribute and collection of taxes, not the idea that they are going to vastly alter the people who come under their rule. So that's the Roman model, that you expand out and grasp vast territories, but enormous diversity of language, of ethnicity, of economic activity remains with the, within the empire. It's not a uniform, homogenized system, uh, unlike, let us say, for example, the Chinese who tried to create this homogeneous uh, empire with a common language, etc. As I mentioned earlier, Islamic societies were characterized by diversity, and that was certainly true of the Umayyad Caliphate. There were both Arabian and Mediterranean populations incorporated within it. Urban versus rural, people living in the countryside, peasants versus people living in the cities, merchants, artisans in the cities, peasants in the countryside, nomadic populations still roaming much of the Arabian Peninsula, but also large sedentary populations, especially along the Mediterranean coast where there are vast agricultural regions, uh, much of what is modern-day Iraq, for example, Syria, where there are areas for agricultural production, you get sedentary populations. One thing that did bind the empire together was the dominance of Arabic as the official language. Now, I just said, it's different from China. Well, that's because the Umayyads didn't try to create a single language that would be learned by everyone. Rather, they simply relied on Arabic as the dominant language, and if you wanted to get along and function within the empire, you had to go learn it. But there was no attempt to say, well, look, at, we're going to impose this language upon others. Now, one of the limits on this empire, and one of the reasons for uh, the re relatively rapid passing of imperial rule in Muslim societies was the reliance on lineage. In other words, dynastic systems. Meaning, how did one become emperor? You inherited it from your father, basically. The limitations of that kind of system are that what tends to happen is that over time, you wind up with some inferior rulers. I mean, let's face it, if you look at your own family and say, well, look, at if we go from generation to generation, not everybody, you know, even if you're from a family, let us say, of uh, efficient business people. You know, my great-grandfather was a merchant, my grandfather was, you know, a corporate executive, my father was that. Okay, but as you go down the line, inevitably you're going to find, yeah, but I'm not, okay? I'm just not a business person. I don't have any of those skills. So, too, in dynasties, as time goes on and one generation inherits from another, you wind up with people who aren't necessarily the most gifted of rulers. This leads to deterioration and one of the reasons why the Umayyad Empire doesn't last for all that long. Among the reasons for dissent in the empire were the favoritism shown towards Arabs. If you wanted a position in the imperial order, in other words, as a military man, as an administrator, you almost had to be Arabic. That meant a very large portion of the population that was not Arabic were largely excluded from opportunities to participate in imperial governance. Another issue had to do with Muslim converts. People who did not convert, and you were not required to convert to Islam, but if you didn't convert, you had to pay a head tax. So this left a considerable portion of the population that did not convert subject to the burdens of a tax that Muslims didn't have to pay, helping create further causes for dissent within the empire. Those kinds of discontents, favoritism towards Arabs and the head tax, helped lead to the disintegration of the empire and its replacement by the Abbasids. Now the Abbasids are different in the sense that they are rooted in the Persian traditions, the ancient Persian world, they are Shiites as opposed to the Umayyads' identification with Sunnism. Baghdad is now the imperial capital as opposed to Damascus. One of the things that the Abbasids do to counter the problems that the Umayyads had faced 
is their focus on ethnic equality. They themselves, of course, many of them are Persian descent, Farsi speaking, not Arabic. And so they allow for participation of non-Arabs in the imperial system. For us, one of the most important things about the rise of this particular empire is the establishment now of Islamic orthodoxy. The caliph as an absolute political and religious authority. Now we see happening in Islam the sorts of things that were already happening in Christianity. The establishment of strict guidelines as to what constitute the principles of Islam, what must be adhered to by believers. However, one of the fatal flaws of the system, this new empire, was the reliance to a considerable degree on slaves both to man the military and to conduct a good deal of the work. That helped lead to a slave revolt in 867 and led to the ultimate decline of the Abbasids. So we can see over a couple of centuries we get two different empires. They are not permanent. They suffer from problems such as originally exclusion of non-Arabs and later the problem of reliance on slave labor and slave performance in the military. But what we also see for our purposes is how Islam gradually comes to establish its own orthodoxy and becomes central to the political legitimacy of imperial systems in the Middle East. So it's n by no means identical to what happens with Christianity, but the overall course of events is similar in the sense that more and more Islam, as Christianity before it, is becoming the legitimizing force for political authority, is becoming part of the cultural, social establishment of societies. It is no longer a revolutionary force, a force challenging the existing order as it was when Muhammad first began to preach in Mecca. Summing it all up, looking at religion and power in the pre-modern world. Religions and ideologies represent expressions of human beings' efforts to search for meaning, the meanings of human life, to try to understand the physical world, and at the same time, to try and achieve order in society. We've seen the evolution from early religious practices such as animism, worshiping natural objects, the great informality, to the development of more formal religious structures as, such as the first great religion, Hinduism. We've seen how Hinduism really built on earlier traditions by integrating deities from earlier regional religious practices into a single largest religious tradition. On the other hand, we also see Buddhism serving that questioning and challenging role for religion as Buddha challenged issues such as caste in his formulation of his own religious system and also challenged of course the authority of Hindu priests. So here we see with Hinduism and Buddhism the authoritative establishment religion and then the new challenging force in Buddhism. Religion isn't the only means by which people try to achieve meaning, understanding, and order. Social philosophies, Confucius in China, Socrates and Plato, the Greek philosophers. Another important religious tradition comes in the Eastern Mediterranean. From Zoroastrianism to Judaism to Christianity to Islam. All of these religions have similar characteristics in terms of the struggles between good and evil, the search for a moral life, the end of days, and judgment day. Universal religions that encompass vast populations, multiple ethnicities and cultures include Buddhism, Christianity, and Islam. What is common throughout these 
religions, philosophies, is this duality. Whether we're talking Greek philosophers, uh, Muhammad, between challenging and questioning the old order and then evolving over time into a legitimizing, stabilizing force within society. As we go on in the course, we're going to see how new forces for change and challenge will emerge in the modern world. And that they will endure a similar experience of challenging the old religious orthodoxy and establishment only to become themselves the new orthodoxy. And we will also see how the basic principles of religious faith and belief will be challenged and how attempts will be made to separate religious inquiry and belief from political and social and scientific philosophy and ideology. All of that will come in the modern era. Before we get there, we're going to look at another fascinating set of characteristics of pre-modern societies, how people organize themselves socially and economically. We'll begin that next time. Thank you.